this is really going to be George, George and I provided some hopeful, hopefully some fodder for uh, the broader conversation. Um, so George, I'll let you kick it off first. And then um, what you'll, what I want everybody to pay attention to is George and I are going to throw out some ideas and we really are looking for input and feedback from the community. And we'll, we'll actually, we'll use poll everywhere to collect some, some information and insights from you. What we're going to do is have George kick this off and he's going to uh, kick it off. And then we're going to alternate with some, some big ideas that we want to throw out to the community to get your reactions. Very good. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Craig. So first, remind ourselves the mission is to improve health by empowering a community to collaboratively generate the evidence that promotes better health decisions and better care. And that mission should influence what we consider to be our big ideas going forward. Next. And then recall, this is how we work, especially for people who may be joining this community call anew for perhaps having attended the symposium. We work together on things, and so part of our idea is how to get this all to work together. Community standards, tools, methods, and clinical questions. That gets applied to our data network where you keep your data local, convert it to the data model. When we want to answer a question, we pre-specify the analysis, send to the network, comes back, and then we collaboratively generate evidence. So the point being that uh, we need, in order to generate evidence, we want to have ideas related to generating the evidence, and we want to have ideas related to supporting that. So if we go to the next slide, here's what we mean by evidence. Recall that we divide into three categories, tallying, clinical characterization, which is just counting things, a population level estimation, what are the causal effects, so that's causal inference at the population level, and then patient level prediction, what will happen to particular people. Next slide. Up. <clears throat> so uh, we're going to talk a little, sorry, I, I forgot the slides. Good. So we're going to talk first about the evidence, and then we'll talk about the infrastructure that supports that. So let me start with this one. Some of you will recall howoften.org. So we had that live. We actually had clinicians at um, Columbia using it for a while. Uh, the thing about howoften.org is, is that it's a characterization study and said for every drug used in the world, for any, every side effect, meaning every code basically named in SNOMED CT, what is the incidence rate? Um, why might that be useful? Um, it's used, you know, okay, so we're cheating. <laughs> what we really want is a causal inference. We can't do every drug, every side effect, every database in the world and do a legend study. We just don't have the capacity to run the zillions of studies, but we can do the incidence rates. And it still gives you useful information. For example, Anna Osterpolitz uh, built the data consult service, and the prototype question that in part led to it was the question, does penicillin cause angioedema? And we were able to go to howoften.org and realize that the rate was extremely low. And if the rate's extremely low, there's a pretty good chance that whether penicillin causes angioedema or not, it's not something to worry about because the rate is going to be too low. Um, so even this characterization information is useful. And we're wondering, although it's gone to the side now, whether we should reenact this as a starting point to the long-term goal of having this be a causal, um, you know, what causes.org instead of howoften.org. Uh, the design is new uses of an ingredient for all ingredients. Uh, the outcomes are um, um, adverse events, either the first or all adverse events, and we have some choice on time at risk and we can report it as incidence proportions and rates. We do it per database and then we aggregate. And in our previous display, we showed the different databases so that we could um, um, uh, see the variability and then how to disseminate it. So then you say, you know, how can we do this in a way that improves the usefulness of the information? Uh, for one, we could nest with indication. So when we give a drug, we're doing, we've lumped people together by why they're taking that drug. The third item on that risk, we learned from incidence rates for uh, vaccines that you need to stratify, that the rate can change by a factor of a thousand depending on the age, say for Mark Harlan infarction. So why don't we stratify by age, sex, and year and make those things uh, more useful? And again, some other things we can look at. So the question is, should we reenact this? set it up as a starting point, and should we look into how to make it a little bit more useful? 
Patrick. Yeah, so, so I'll just uh, to reinforce this point. We started down this path. We produced some evidence, but over the last year and a half, I think we've learned a lot about how to. Uh, we've learned a lot about the sciences, uh, science of incidents, uh, and we've also actually built some pretty impressive technology as a community. And so the question is, given that our mission is about generating evidence, one opportunity that we want to put out there is that we should produce evidence at scale for the incidents of adverse events and uh, basically renew the work that we had started, but think about this as a large community effort. I see that before we go into the second idea, I see that uh, uh, Eileen raised her hand. Eileen, do you have a question or comment about this? Actually, no, sorry, that was by accident. <laughs> okay, no worries. Okay, so um, so what so 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 we want to keep we want you to keep in mind this one idea that we think we as a community could do large scale characterization of incidence rates, and that that we think that this could be helpful. I'll, I'll tell you my personal interest in this one is largely motivated by some of the work that many of you all contributed in our community. To me, it's just absolutely appalling that our colleagues at the FDA and EMA were left scrambling to figure out how often. Uh, you know, background rates of thrombotic events were occurring in specific populations. It would seem to me that I see I see Thamir on the screen. Like, you know, no matter where you are in the world, no matter what regulatory agency, you shouldn't be scrambling to figure out what a background rate is and an observed rate is when you're in the heat of trying to make important policy decisions for the world. And so, if we as a community can be proactive in generating this evidence and making it available at a global scale, I think that. Um, as George laid out, there's a opportunity for this evidence to be useful in ways we anticipate. But I'm also excited about this idea because I think that the there's also a wide range of opportunities that we probably can't anticipate that will only happen once we generate this evidence and make it publicly available. So that's idea number one. We're going to walk through four big ideas and uh, and three kind of foundational pillars that we're going to walk through. So keep that one in mind because we'll come back to it. If Craig, you go to the next slide, we'll talk about idea number two. Um, George just said he doesn't think it's feasible, but so I'll go ahead and throw it out there as, as feasible. I'm going to keep beating the drum that I think that that the world needs an international pharmacovigilance system. Uh, and until it exists, I'm going to continue to argue that we should be the organization that produces it. And so big idea number two in the care in the category of causal inference and effect estimation is that we should build the safety of interventions real real world evidence network or siren and the point of this is that um, we have learned quite a lot from our work doing legend that we can scale effect estimation for comparing treatments within the same indication we've also learned from the work that uh, uh fawn boo presented at the odyssey symposium this last year that We've started to develop sophisticated statistical methods that help us in the opportunity of discovering safety issues and providing frameworks that we're you know, collaborating with our colleagues at the FDA and CBER to think about how that can actually work in the context of safety surveillance. Um, and uh, as Bartine presented during the plenary session, we've also figured out appropriate ways to appropriately manage statistic statistics as it relates to multiplicity adjustment. And all of our objective diagnostics allow us to produce credible, you know, calibrated confidence intervals that pass our objective diagnostics and give us confidence that the estimates we're producing uh, are useful. And so my assertion is that given that we've now kind of figured out the scientific best practices, we figured out the technology, we figured out the statistics, why can't we as a community just agree that focus on safety um, is a public health imperative? We know that no one regulatory agency, no one product manufacturer has the collective vested interest to put together a global data network that can perform analyses of all products. But we as an open science community have both the data infrastructure, the technology, and the wherewithal to do this. So I, I would like to assert that uh, idea number two, building an inter international pharmacovigilance uh, system that I think we now have all the building blocks in place as it relates to our um, uh, our ability to create standardized exposure cohorts, our work that we're doing in phenotype development to establish a library of outcomes 
that we have uh, those building blocks in place that we can connect together with our Hades packages to generate evidence. There is open questions here. We need to think about which indications we focus on. We need to define what that library of outcomes we want to focus on for safety would be. And we need to figure out the appropriate uh, mechanisms for disseminating the evidence, not only to our, our regulatory colleagues and product manufacturers, but also to all um, stakeholders that have a vested interest in understanding the safety of products. Now, in legend, we actually looked at both safety and effectiveness. And so George and I have split up the questions of safety and effectiveness. I'm gonna focus on safety here. My assertion would be in the context of safety, what I would assert that the world actually needs as it relates to pharmacovigilance is for us to at least start with proactive safety surveillance and monitoring for whether or not we can observe causal effects that suggest that exposure to a product increases the risk of adverse outcomes. I think that the bar for evidence when we are trying to do no harm and, and appropriately warn patients about potential risks is different for safety than effectiveness. And I think what we've seen from the work we've done in our prior work is that sometimes the safety evidence that we generate may be a little bit easier to be uh, responsive to um, than some of the clinical debates that happen in the effectiveness space. And so while I think legend provides us a beautiful on-ramp to study diseases for both safety and effectiveness, I think that uh, one of the opportunities that I think is in front of us is for some of us to really center, center our focus on safety and think about how we meet the needs of the pharmacovigilance community more broadly and that others can focus on effectiveness given that effectiveness may have some more nuanced considerations that George will talk about in just a second. So idea number one is if we're going to renew howoften.org, that's just answering the question, uh, what is the incidence of an adverse event associated with an exposure? Idea number two is why don't we start actually trying to produce causal effect estimates? So that means producing relative risks associated with exposures and outcomes, and to use that data proactively to identify potential safety concerns, as well as to make that resource something that could be responsive for when folks have specific hypotheses about relationships between exposure and outcomes, they can look up the evidence that has been generated from our community within the same capacity. So number one and number two very much are kind of predicated on a safety context. Uh, Craig, if you can go forward to number three, George will talk about where we think we can go on the effectiveness side. Thanks, Patrick. I mean, as we get to the point on safety where we can do a full causal analysis on every possible disease for every possible drug, the incidence will just be kind of, you know, a sidebar footnote of like, well, here's the incidence rate, then here's the causal effect, and then we'll be there. But on the way there, we may want to collect those incidences and show them by themselves as howoften.org. When we run these large scale uh, effectiveness studies, you know, we publish about ACE versus ARB or, um, you know, diuretics, hydrochlorothiazide versus uh, an ACE inhibitor or something. You know, we produce an overall effect, but immediately the clinicians come back with, well, that's that's interesting, but I'm actually interested in how I would treat someone with heart failure or diabetes or hypertension or, or uh, kidney uh, insufficiency. So they immediately go to the su a relevant subgroup analysis, and usually it varies by disease. I mean, there's some things that you can predefine, guess that would be re relevant for all treatment effects. And then some are really specific to that class of patients. And so if we wanna have an effect on patient care, I think we're going to have to quickly move from just doing an overall treatment effect in whatever population happens to be in the various databases we own to how it breaks up into subgroups. So uh, we can do large scale estimation of outcomes of effect. Remember, our legend studies, the effectiveness and the safety outcomes are kind of the same. They're just phenotypes and we just group them one way or the other. But for the effectiveness ones, uh, it becomes especially important at looking at these subgroup analyses. So we can either decide ahead of time, top, you know, kind of top down in this disease, type two diabetes uh, is gonna be a comorbidity that we care about, or we can go bottom up and say, develop algorithms that look for heterogeneity of treatment effect 
based on the data that we have available, and then from there explore what the heterogeneity is. Or conversely say, okay, we have these subgroups and we're gonna look for homogeneity of treatment effect. That is prove that to the best of our ability, there's no difference among them. And then we've kind of answered the question. There's some subpopulations that come naturally like age, sex, race, and then various comorbidities, or, you know, again, we can go through the list of covariates or classes of covariates and run through them looking for a uh, heterogeneity of treatment effect. And then, of course, you know, equity also will fit in here as another place where there may be a heterogeneity of a treatment effect uh, across different groups who may be uh, underserved. Uh, but then other than that, it would be just going through our standard comparative cohorts uh, going through the entire legend study with calibration to produce the best evidence we can. Let's see, uh, Patrick, should I turn back to you? Yeah, so so we believe, and I appreciate that I see lots of people already entering lots of insights into the yeah, chat, I'm which is great. Yeah, whether this we should is, comment on it, yeah. Yeah, so I, I, I encourage people to continue to do that because we would definitely want to open it up for, for, for conversation. I'll just, I'll just reinforce here that we, what George and I are trying to highlight for you are, I think, what we think are big opportunities, and it re does require us to think think very differently about how we actually scale some of the work we're doing. So, if it's already crazy enough to think, as I'm seeing in the chat, you know, like we're talking about the potential feasibility of producing just incidence rates for all exposures and all outcomes, and then we're talking about doing safety surveillance, where we're actually trying to study the main effects of exposures and outcomes across a very large scale. Now, what George is introducing here is that if we really want to get serious about studying safety, we actually also need to think about across the range of subpopulations and how we define those subpopulations is going to be relevant. You know, Christoph posted in the chat like, well, we need to even think about beyond just a single drug and think about poly polypharmacy. And that's another good dimension for us to be uh, to be thinking about. Um, the point here is that each of these efforts, if we want to get serious about generating evidence, it requires both the nuance of making sure that we're performing the analysis correctly, as well as the scale of how do we actually apply systematic approaches to generating the evidence following all of the best practices. So while we are talking about something that's quite ambitious to the to the to the, the extreme of maybe seeming infeasible, also want to you know remind you all that we are now a community of over 3,200 collaborators with the world's largest data network, with some of the greatest tools that are being used by downloaded over 400,000 times. So we might as well be thinking big if we're gonna go after opportunities. Several several of the comments are talking about, you know, quality improvement and why are we focusing on drugs here? I think that there's tremendous opportunities for us to think about um, these ideas more broadly. The reason here we're focusing on exposures and outcomes is because at least provides a a specific space where we can generate evidence, where we know there's needs in the clinical guidelines and, and what have you, but absolutely encourage all of you to be thinking about the other dimensions of, of large scale problems that we can be thinking about. And indeed, you know, the incidence of adverse events within populations is not just a problem that's applicable to uh, drug exposures uh, and studying safety can be broadened even further and certainly comparative effectiveness of medical interventions more broadly. But we think, given what we've learned from legend, uh, uh, that it is potentially feasible for us to apply those principles at scale for safety surveillance of main effects. And it's probably necessary for us to apply more nuanced approach in the context of safety surveillance. Patrick, um, just, to, yeah, just before you go to the next slide, just to point out on two of the comments, because we may get lost in the shuffle. First on polypharmacy, you know, a first cut would be treating the second drug as you know, one of our covariates before we do the full analysis that really looks at polypharmacy top down. On the question about confounders, remember we're using large scale propensity score adjustments. So our choice of confounders is, confounder adjustment is everything in the database. So it won't vary from study to study. It, it, the confounders do vary, but LSPS will always include everything we have available. Uh, Craig, you mind going on number four? I'm, gl I'm really glad that this is stimulating a good conversation in the chat for those that see it. Um, so uh, George mentioned that we own a URL called howoften.org. Many of you might know that we also own a URL called what'llhappentome.org. Uh, and, um, you know, in our community, I think we're doing some of the absolute top-notch work in trying to find appropriate uses for patient-level prediction in observational data. I 
still think that as a broader research community, while there we're we're still growing on that hype cycle of the value and impact of machine learning and artificial intelligence, we still haven't necessarily figured out exactly what its direct um, uh, use as an evidence source uh, can or should be. Um, but one idea that we wanted to throw out is that if if we are quantifying the incidence of adverse events in a particular population and we're estimating the relative risk associated with outcomes, that it's possible that we can also provide evidence that personalizes the risk of outcomes following treatment initiation. So much like we could apply characterization methods at scale for all exposures and all outcomes, we can do the same thing for effect estimation. Uh, we can also think about uh, uh, applying our patient level prediction framework to try to generate evidence. And in this context, I think it's really interesting to think about how will those prediction models actually be used. At a first blush, the, the application is just to know whether or not the outcome is actually predictable. And our primary model performance uh, uh, outputs that we produce for patient level prediction help us understand whether or not models uh, have good discrimination and calibration and the extent to which that they are something that can be externally validated across different uh, populations. But if we're trying to make information actionable for a provider or a patient, it could be useful for an individual to be able to enter in their own baseline characteristics and see their own personalized risks associated with, uh, uh, with their information. To a certain extent, this is a natural extension of the incidence rate work and how often at org, where we learn from our work last year that we actually need to stratify by age and sex because we see substantial differences in background rates. Well, age and sex are predictors, as are a multitude of other baseline characteristics that one could have. And so why not consider applying our models at scale? Now, some of the open questions here, uh, it's still actually producing a non-causal uh, prediction. It's simply telling you the probability of you experiencing an outcome following some index date. Uh, and that's whether or not you were exposed or basically without, without regard to any sort of causal effect. One of the things that Jenna Reps has raised on the Odyssey, on the PLP working group, is that there's still a tremendous need for us to develop methods for counterfactual prediction, where we're not just producing the probability of uh, an outcome happening with or without exposure, but we're actually trying to tease that out to understand what's the incremental probability due to exposure that one might want to look at. Regardless, we currently have the capacity within our community to apply the open source tools we've developed to uh, to conduct patient level prediction and to, to put this information out there. And I think in the context of safety surveillance, particularly, um, I'm personally dismayed at the idea that we currently have you know, product labels that just provide a comma separated list of adverse events without any understanding of frequency and without any understanding of whether or not um, that's a risk that I should be worried about based on my personal probability and without any sort of causal effect estimate to understand whether or not I really believe it is you know, attributable to the exposure. So I think given where we are today to where we could be, I'm excited about how characterization, estimation and prediction could actually complement each other. I think there's a lot of open questions about how we would actually make use of these models in an appropriate manner. Um, but I think one of the ways we could figure that out is by us collaborating as our community of 3000 uh, researchers uh, around the world to, to try to con generate evidence and put it in play to see how it's useful rather than just uh, thinking about it in the abstract. So these four ideas, We've got one characterization idea about how often.org uh, characterizing the incidence of adverse events. We've provided you two big ideas for effect estimation. Uh, one to think about a safety surveillance system. Uh, and the second is to think about heterogeneity of treatment effects and subgroups for comparative effectiveness. And then here for prediction, thinking about what will we put on our website, what will happen to me.org that we can provide useful prediction information. We think that these are big audacious ideas that our community is completely capable of tackling if we have the collective enthusiasm and interest in doing that. What this is going to be based on, though, is some foundational pillars that we know we need to, to work on. So, Craig, if you go to the next slide, George will introduce those. All right, so we have our evidence use cases and then we have our foundational pillars and we're going to discuss three of them today, standardized vocabulary, standards data network and standardized open source tools. 
So let's uh, go to the next. Um, so we have the opportunity to increase transparency and maturity with vocabulary development evaluation process. Right now, the vocabulary, uh, the coordinating center uh, enlists the help of Odysseus to run the vocabulary for us. And then we have our uh, people in the community who contribute through the CDM and then therefore the vocabulary subgroup working on that. Uh, we believe for the thing to expand and to be maintained at this scale, we need more help from the community. And to do that, we need to be more transparent about the vocabulary. So our proposed solution is first to conduct landscape assessment to understand community needs. That's not just we need one more code. There's an error here. That's more on a large scale, long term view of how this needs to move forward. In order to get input and help from people, we need to develop a code of conduct and developer guidelines. We need to disseminate our vocabulary process and then use a documentation and a roadmap for what we're trying to achieve. And then establish a centralized development infrastructure. That's where we can people can contribute to the vocabulary. Um, and then when you contribute, you got to see what you did to the vocabulary and making that change. So we need standardized test development. And in addition, you know, we need a vocabulary version release distribution service. That is, once the thing's built, what about the use of the thing and how can we, uh, you know, manage that process? Uh, so the bottom line is, I think that there's going to be a core vocabulary uh, that is uh, contributed by the community, but also overseen very strictly centrally with the possibility of other parts being added in a controlled, in a somewhat controlled fashion, largely driven by the community, which would then be tested to make sure it conforms, uh, but maintained by the community. That way we don't have a, you know, a central maintenance problem that grows uh, unmanageably. So our goal is to make this more open and tr uh, more transparent and with greater input from the community. Well, help from the community, not just input of what uh, someone else should do, actual work from the community. Yeah, I know a lot of people are coming to our community wanting to just use our use our open community data standard, download the vocabulary. We've got thousands of organizations that are downloading the vocabulary. And we do feel a sense of obligation associated with making sure that this is a high quality product, but it also needs to be a community resource which goes both directions, as George is saying. It's something that we feel like needs to, to continue to, to mature and grow so that everybody can depend on it, but it also has reached a point where we really need the, commu the community to support its ongoing care and maintenance to make sure that it's the continues to thrive as a sustainable resource for everybody. Next slide, Greg. So we also need to, uh, as, as George was highlighting, we need to increase transparency and maturity of the vocabulary. I, I would assert that we also need to be doing the same thing for our Odyssey data network. Uh, and just in our standardized data network doesn't just mean we have a data model that people can choose to use. Uh, as Claire mentioned at the symposium, uh, not just that we have a data model with lots of optional extensions that people go ahead and do whatever they want, um, but rather that we actually are trying to um, come together as one community to establish a credible data network whereby we are using the same consistent data standards, applying the same conventions across our network, and we're truly learning from each other. So some of our proposed solutions as it relates to our standardized data network is number one, to create an Odyssey data network catalog that encourages network studies across interested partners and promotes data quality practices. We've seen in the last year with the release of the Eden, uh, the Eden portal um, that it is possible for us to develop standardized tools to support data cataloging. So it's not just free text open uh, descriptions that can be antiquated after they're entered in, but rather that we can actually think about how we take advantage of tools like Achilles um, to produce aggregate summary statistics from databases uh, and share a minimal subset of that so that we can actually enable uh, evaluation. Uh, at at uh, the symposium, we talked about database diagnostics explicitly as a tool that could be applied across the data, data catalog so that we're not no longer asking the question, what does a database have? But instead we can ask, a, ask the question, which databases are fit for use for my particular research question? 
And I think that's a really exciting opportunity that I think we're uniquely equipped to do within our Odyssey network of 450 databases that have already been converted to the OMOP common data model to start to think about how we actually capitalize on um, figuring out how to foster those collaborations. Now, um, doing that, actually, what we've also learned over the last several years on Ostropolitz has shown in her network study where we did the simplest of things. We just counted up the prevalence of concepts. And yet from that, we were able to learn across our network at a scale we've never done before. And so I think the real value of us being a data network is not just to be a set of silos of organizations that are willing to participate in studies occasionally, but to actually figure out how do we truly learn from each other? And so the, the idea of us generating aggregate summary statistics, such as concept prevalence data, that actually makes it possible for everyone in the community to, to enable more generalizable phenotypes so that you're not just based, basing your phenotype development on what codes do I see in my one database, but rather you're thinking about what are the codes that are observed across the entire community and how can I build a phenotype with the idea in mind that I expect this to be a global resource that everybody will be able to benefit from. So if organizations as part of our data network can share this minimum set of aggregate summary statistics, we can actually benefit the whole of the community who's actually contributing to our pillars of phenotype development and evaluation, as well as uh, contribute to those who are looking to do network studies and to figure out what questions we wanna answer. So I'm really excited about trying to see uh, how we can come together, building out the work that Anna has done, the work that Claire has done, and the work that we've seen in the Eden community, and actually try to mature that at the level of our Odyssey data network, uh, so that we can have a better understanding of which data partners really are um, uh, capable of generating evidence, interested in participating in studies, and ready to collaborate on this next step. And until we formalize this data network uh, uh, in, in this level of maturity, I think we're still going to be in the situation where we are excited about the potential of 450 databases, but then we see the reality of most of our studies only have a few dozen databases participating. I think we can learn a lot more from our data network if we can figure out how to um, formalize some of these processes, and I'd really like to see that be a priority as part of this pillar. And George, I'll let you take the last one. Thanks, and uh, just point out on pillar two, as Patrick pointed out to me, just to emphasize that uh, what we do here can help outside of Odyssey and then would indirectly help us. That is, as we assess databases and that becomes public knowledge, uh, they happen to use the OMOP common data model, uh, but it tells us about the databases and that could become a worldwide resource regardless of what data model they happen to use. And that would then pull people back towards Odyssey. Pillar three, We've already started working on standardized open source tools, so increased adoption and ease of use of Hades packages and their open source analytic tools, the centralized infrastructure to test the tools against each of our platforms. Um, I like the idea of a referent benchmark study so that organizations can execute to demonstrate that their tool stack works uh, properly. Of course, our documentation educational materials promote the use of Odyssey tools. Sometimes we do that not only within Odyssey, but outside of Odyssey using our tools. Uh, Cyclops being an example there. And, um, and basically needing more help, just like for vocabulary, we need more help from the community to build and maintain these tools. So we've been working on this with the uh, Hades work group, and we're just saying that we need to continue on this and that it's a critical pillar. And I think what we really need from the community is, is as we see the adoption of these tools increasing, of course, we want we need to make the tools easier to use and uh, we want to support adoption, but we also have to figure out how we're going to actually maintain this. And right now we've got an awful lot of weight sitting on an awful small number of shoulders in our community. And, you know, with, with you know, thanks to Martine and Mark and Adam and all of the IADs maintainers, we definitely find ourselves in a situation where it's a good situation to be in, which is there's tremendous demand for these tools, but we also need to be very mindful and uh, figure out as a community how we actually support that. So 
I'm glad for for Paul and, and Adam main, uh, establishing our open source community work group and trying to pull in additional contributors, but we also need to be looking more broadly across our community about how do we actually make, maintain that these system, uh, these these tools, because really, if we don't have vocabulary, if we don't have uh, data network, if we don't have tools, we don't have the capacity to go after any of those big ideas that George and I tried to outline at the start here. So I, I, actually I'm really excited to see an active set of chat. I'm also mindful that we've got over 220 folks on the call here uh, and not everybody can actually see the chat. And so the one thing I was gonna, if you actually go to the next slide, Craig, I think it's just the, the poll everywhere.com. Um, I wanna encourage, um, Craig's gonna go through all of the, the, the standing updates, but George and I really wanna hear from you all. And so we're gonna leave this activated for the rest of the hour and probably even after this. But um, hopefully we've given you some food for thought about uh, some ideas that we'd like to go after as a community. We really want to hear from folks about which of these ideas excite you, which of these ideas you think are stupid, um, maybe some ideas that we've missed. Um, but we uh, encourage you to go to polleverywhere.com slash Patrick Ryan 800 and you can enter in your own feedback. George and I are really actively seeking your input about these ideas. We we think that there's tremendous opportunity for us to go after some big ideas now that our community has grown, now that we've matured as a, a community, that our data standards are being uh, applied, that we've developed these tools that everybody's been able to use. But ultimately, going back to our mission, we're, we're about producing evidence. And we want to get evidence out there in the hands of decision makers so that they can make good decisions and improve their health care. Um, and so while we've got lots of building blocks and pieces that are making progress, we really think that there's a great opportunity for us as a community to go after some 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 big ticket items. Uh, and we're really interested in understanding from you all which of which of those big items we should go after, what excites you and how you can uh, help contribute uh, to making these uh, bold proposals become a reality. And so we're going to leave this open. I know Craig's got lots of updates to go through, um, but we're going to leave this uh, poll everywhere open. And we really would like to hear from you. And we will be, um, you know, reviewing those responses as as uh, as um, as you're entering them throughout the time. Uh, and also welcome any input on the Odyssey forums, uh, or or just reach out directly to George and myself because we really do hope that based on your feedback, we can actually establish some priorities that we can um, we can think about moving Odyssey forward in 2023 and beyond. So with that, Craig, we'll turn it back to, to you, but um, we'll be monitoring the chat here and monitoring the uh, poll everywhere for for um, for the input that we're for looking. So thank you all for your attention. Great, thank you, uh, Patrick and George. Oh, excuse me for that presentation. That was excellent. Uh, I put it in the chat, uh, polyev.com backslash Patrick Ryan 800. Uh, I know not everybody has the chat, uh, so I just want to make sure we say it again a couple times. Um, but please do fill that out. Um, you know, we get some great, great uh, input from that polyev, so please uh, check it out. And like I said, we can continue that discussion at another time. All right, uh, we're going to go now to our community updates. So let me pull that. OK. So you may not have known this, but we're going to talk about future directions of Odyssey today. Um, before we do that, uh, I wanted to, uh, we said, we talked about that we were going to be announcing our uh, best community contribution awards. Uh, this is the panoramic picture from uh, our symposium, which I actually I thought came out really good. Uh, we'll, we're still working on getting the videos and all the other pictures, so we'll figure out a way to get them uh, for everybody to be able to see. But we did get this. Uh, you may look at this. There's going to be a few of you who look at this and say, that is not where I was standing in that picture. Uh, and you are absolutely correct. If you remember, he took three pictures, um, like left side, center, and right side. And if you happen to be right in the middle, then through the magic of Photoshop, you got spliced together and moved into an open space. So uh, it's not, your your memory isn't fading. You just, 
you just through the power of technology got moved. But uh, it's a pretty awesome picture and a great memory of of just how many people were uh, were, were there and, and and collaborating together. All right, best con uh, community contribution awards uh, for data standards. So remember, this was voted on uh, by the community uh, after the uh, collaborator showcase in data standards. It was uh, analyzing the effect of hypertension on retinal thickness using radiology common data model, uh, the RCDM. Uh, this was one of our lightning talks. Uh, Cho Hyung Park led this lightning talk, but uh, full team is listed below. Methods research. Uh, again, one of the lightning talks. This was assessing racial fairness of dialysis allocation in end-stage renal disease. Uh, Lin Ying Zhang was the uh, presenter during the lightning talk, uh, but the full team uh, listed below. Congratulations to Lin Ying. Open source analytics. This was cohort definition validation in Atlas. Uh, Charity Hilton, along with Saul Crumpton and John Duke, uh, the honoree in open source analytics. And then finally, in clinical applications, a pilot characterization study assessing health equity in mental health care delivery within the state of Georgia. This one led by Jacob Zelko, the whole team listed there below. So uh, first of all, congratulations. Uh, really was, uh, many people have said this was the best uh, full, you know, total work, um, the highest level of, of research that we had ever seen at a symposium collaborator showcase. So uh, really everybody was uh, fantastic, uh, but certainly congratulations to these four. Uh, as mentioned before, and I'm just going to go to it right now, uh, we will be uh, asking these presenters if they'd like to share on November 8th uh, their presentations. Now, I know a couple of them were lightning talks, but uh, by having a presentation does allow for a little more Q&A. Uh, so if we, if they are so willing, well, would be, I see Jacob Zelko, so congratulations, Jacob. Um, November 8th, uh, if, if people would like to uh, share these uh, presentations and then we can talk about a little bit as a community, that would be great. I'll be reaching out to everybody uh, before then. Again, you can see what we have coming up. Uh, again, November 15th, open network studies. I've only heard from one person. I'd love to hear from a couple more uh, people who are running open studies uh, that would like to inform the community about them, possibly call for, excuse me, data partners or collaboration in any way. Uh, reach out to me over uh, through Teams or email. Let me know that you want to be part. Uh, like I said, we do have some room for it. Uh, and then what we'll have coming up the rest of the year, the speed dating, which was a lot of fun, uh, our work group updates, fall publications, and then our, kind of our natural, our year-end calls uh, in December 13th and the 20th. Next week, uh, we're looking forward to a session of Meet the Titans. Uh, we did this last year, it was really fun. You'll hear from our Titan Award winners uh, talking about their journey into Odyssey and um, kind of what they've done over the past year that they felt maybe uh, was a reason that they were honored in this way. So please do join us next week uh, for our Meet the Titan session. All right, uh, a couple of shout outs. I uh, wanna start with uh, a team led by Elzo Pereira Pinto Jr. A uh, number of co-authors integrating real-world data from Brazil and Pakistan into the OMOP common data model and standardized health analytics framework to characterize COVID-19 in the global south. This recently published in Jamia. And then uh, to uh, this paper in uh, JMIR, Medical Informatics, standardized description of the feature extraction process to transform raw data into meaningful information for enhancing data reuse consensus study. Uh, is anybody from either of these two papers here uh, that would like to just discuss um, e either of these papers? I see Kenneth Rivette's hand raised. I'm not sure. Uh, Kenneth, do you have about the paper or something else? No, no, that was an accident. Sorry. Oh, no worries. No worries. Um, OK, so we will have uh, both of these studies uh, linked on our community calls page later on today. So please do uh, check them, check them out. All right, any other shout outs before we move forward? 
OK, what we have coming up, uh, we'll start with our upcoming work group calls. Uh, there's 10 of them coming up this week. Uh, one in particular, uh, I'm going to make sure we have time to shout out. Uh, so Paul, just hold on for one second. Uh, but anybody else from either of any of these work groups want to share anything about maybe what's on the agenda or any interesting topics of conversation you had? Uh, either recently or at the symposium, anything that you'd like to share uh, for the community? Okay, so please do check out our work groups page, uh, both to learn more about our work groups and for uh, information about upcoming calls. I mentioned uh, open source community is Wednesday at 11 a.m. This is going to be a, a really important call. So, Paul, do you want to discuss this for a second? Yeah, and I added a link in the chat. Uh, so we are uh, have been doing some great technical work on in, in bringing new contributors into our open source community. We've also some, invited some international leaders in open source in our neighboring communities, like in Bioconductor, is coming tomorrow. Uh, so we're really excited to talk to her about how they form their community advisory committee, how they uh, lay out some of their governance issues, and how they build sustaining uh, functions within their community. So we're going to be inviting several speakers to our open source working groups in the future calls, uh, but we'd invite everyone to be involved in this discussion for how we make decisions and how we uh, bring new developers into our community. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Paul. Um... So please do join that. And Paul, as Paul said, uh, he put the link in the chat. OK, this was shared, uh, excuse me, during the symposium, uh, but uh, there's a healthcare system OMOP adoption survey. Uh, so anybody who is who represents a healthcare system has adopted OMOP. Uh, the healthcare systems interest group is gathering some evidence to support additional healthcare systems adoption decisions. Uh, so they're really asking for anybody to to take this survey. Uh, there are some card, the cards were passed around at the symposium. Um, so maybe you saw it there, but if not, uh, or if you didn't fill it out yet, please do check it out. Uh, I don't know if John or Melanie, anybody wants to say anything about this. I, I know it was talked about a little bit at the symposium. No, that covers it. Thank you. OK, great. Um, and uh, this link, uh, if you can't copy it now, it's hard for me to get back from PowerPoint to the chat, but uh, make sure it's on the community calls page as well, and, and we'll share it on, on social. So uh, please do fill it out and pass it around, you know, send it around to anybody who, who you think uh, could fill it out and provide some information. All right, I mentioned this last week. Uh, version two of our journey was uh, shared at the symposium. Um, 96 pages, I believe, of uh, really just a high level overview of everything that is going on in the community, including all publications over the last 10 years, uh, all our data partners, Hades, everything else um, work in open source analytics and methods research and, and uh, you know, community events. Uh, so please do check it out. But also, if you want to order some books for your own organization, uh, you can do that. I can give you uh, the uh, name of the printer who has the file. So just kind of reach out to me and, and I'll, I'll help you out there. Uh, this was mentioned last week, but October 31st, uh, there's going to be another uh, Pioneer Study-a-thon. Um, this was uh, about uh, metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer. Um, if you are interested, I believe there's a new team set up in our team's environment. Uh, so reach out if you need to be part of that. Uh, but we wanted to remind you, and, and this people can join this uh, remotely. So if you have any questions, uh, reach out or or join that team. All right, the APAC Symposium is coming up. It's November 12th through 13th uh, at Taipei Medical University, though there is a remote option on the second day. One change you'll notice on day one, the tutorial workshop uh, setup has changed. If it looks a little familiar, it's because it's now going to mirror what happened at the Global Symposium. And there was a lot of really positive response from that. Uh, as I mentioned before, with those videos, when they're available, we're certainly going to get those videos up as well. I know a lot of people have been asking about them already, um, but that was really popular. It's going to be taught live. These are not going to be videos from the Global Symposium. These, this is going to be uh, you know, a, a live tutorial. 
So this will not have the virtual component, uh, unlike the main conference on the 13th. So day one tutorial, day two main conference, registration for both is available on the Odyssey websites. All right, we are starting the social showcase this week. If you're unfamiliar uh, on Twitter and LinkedIn every day, we will uh, share one uh, one research presentation from our uh, symposium showcase. Uh, we put them on Twitter, we put them on LinkedIn. We ask people to share them out, uh, certainly to follow us, read them, check them out, see the web page, which has the brief report everywhere and certainly a few other um, in some cases, some people share some other uh, materials to uh, to add some information. So this is what we'll have on the social showcase. This will be going on for a few months because we really did have a number of amazing uh, pieces of research shared. Uh, but we are starting the social showcase. So if you're not following us on Twitter or LinkedIn, please do so. Check out this work. Share it with your own networks. Uh, you know, help spread the word of what Odyssey is doing. Uh, OK, a couple openings. Uh, we went through these last week a little more in detail, so I just want to make sure that uh, we share them. Uh, FDA, Cedar, uh, Tufts Medicine, uh, Johns Hopkins. And then I saw in the chat uh, that Aiden, who we've already talked about, um, uh, was asking about jobs. So Aiden, did you want to share anything? Um, you can certainly send me something. I can put it up next week. But is there anything you wanted to uh, no, we'll be advertising ones. I just wanted to know if there was a Slack channel um, for um, jobs as well as just announcing on this. Yeah, so you can post them to the forums. I think there's a there's a, a specific thread, but you can post to the forums. And then if you want to share with me, I'll get it on the weekly digest and also in uh, our community calls. And then the link to the Thanks. website for the Pioneer Study of Thon. I don't have it on me, but. Uh, I think Asi might have just done it, or we'll make sure we get it. Um, but Asi, is that? Yeah, that's the link. Yeah, uh, I just posted it there. OK, great. So thank you for doing that. All right, any other announcements that anybody wants to share? OK, so usually I use this moment to set up our speaker, but we've already done that. So I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, Again, please uh, do continue filling out uh, the poll EV. Uh, Patrick Ryan, will, I'll get that um, link on the community calls page. So if you didn't do it, you couldn't find it, you don't have access to the chat, I think they're going to leave it open for at least 24 hours. So we'll get that poll up there. Uh, really, community input is, is very important here. We're, we're thinking about the directions that Odyssey can go moving forward, but it really needs full community support uh, and help as, as both Patrick and George discussed. So uh, we certainly want to hear as many uh, opinions as possible. Uh, if nobody has anything else they want to share, uh, I will close this meeting. But thank you to George and Patrick for the presentation. Congratulations uh, to our Best Community Contribution Award winners. Thank you all for joining. Have a great day and a great week. And hopefully we'll see you next week uh, on Tuesday for our Meet the Titan session. Have a great day, everyone. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.